So yeah, um, today we will talk about the hardware and firmware and the firmware vulnerabilities and how this affects the entire trust of the device and what we can do to run uh, incident response and forensic on the devices. Uh, it's not super technical talk, but it will be some technical details. Some of the slides will be overview. Uh, you can uh, check um, other sources from Mick and Jesse and myself about the more deeper research we provide over the years about some exploitation techniques and the different presentation in our past conferences of the different aspects of that. And uh, uh, in the end or close to the end, we will discuss a specific vulnerability and specific uh, uh, components uh, uh, in the boot flow and what is the implication to have a vulnerabilities uh, and that component, uh, how that could be used by the attacker to compromise the entire integrity of the device and uh, infect device as the as the legacy rootkits was infecting in MBR and VBR um, previously. Uh, so um, just uh, uh, 30 seconds, I'm sitting on co-founder of Eclipsium and previously was researchers with Mickey and Jesse. We did a lot of research in a different area again, just referencing our back Twitter and, and GitHub and other links about us. So uh, when we're talking about the devices, uh, usually people believe that this is monolithic, uh, trusted blocks and has the best security practice possibly have um, uh, as well as we have in a, in a software world, like all of these DevOps, uh, the most kind of advanced techniques, CFI and all of this kind of stuff. Um, but in reality, the hardware is not monolithic. Can, like, like typical laptop or server contains many components designed and implemented from the different OEM on a different time, uh, time slot. And they was basically integrated all together to have a final device. And it's very complicated. And many of the components has the software running on that components called it firmware. For example, network card has its own firmware. Uh, UFI, it's a separate firmware, system firmware. Then it could be Intel ME firmware, it could be Wi-Fi card firmware, and so on. And all of this complexity create the, uh, the big attack surface, which is researchers and attackers both looking in uh, to find interesting, interesting weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Um, so, and they go in from all of that components and looking very deeply uh, from the different perspective and servers and um, and, and laptops. And when we're talking about even appliances, in most appliances, it's just uh, an neither ARM or MIPS or x86 box, which has uh, um, the same complexity as the server and may have a remote interfaces like BMC or may have a remote interfaces like web interfaces, things like that. And it's all kind of uh, has its own update processes and their own kind of supply chain and security practices, which has a lot of weaknesses. And uh, you can see on the screen, I will not go one by one, but when you see the red box as it basically was exploited in the wild, and then you can see like USB was exploited in the wild, UFI, uh, BMC was exploited in the wild, uh, um, Intel MEIMT was exploited in the wild by Platinum Group, and then the rest components, even if they was not exploited in the wild, there was a significant risk so, which was introduced from raw hammer to Roca to Spectrum Meltdown, which is basically breaking security of entire device. And then uh, when we're talking about each component and the system overall in general, uh, there is uh, two things which is uh, uh, need to take care for sure is basically secure update and secure boot. Secure update is meaning that we can update that component from a very securely. With cryptography signature when it could not be spoofed in the middle by the attacker. Secure boot meaning that uh, the software we're running on a late stage will be verified by the software from a running early stage. So then we know that uh, uh, if you have some secret uh, or some kind of very, uh, very trusted uh, um, initialization phase, the rest of the phases would be verified. And this very trusted initialization phases uh, in the recent five years got huge traction on the hardware root of trust. Is basically all of the different technology which is implementing this first phase, which will run uh, verification of the 
of the next phase, which will be responsible to the verification on the rest of the system. And there's a lot of development happened from the multiple vendors, uh, from uh, vendors like desktop vendors and laptop vendors like HP, to the cloud providers like uh, uh, um, uh, Nitra, Amazon Nitra, and then uh, uh, Titan and Open Titan for the Google Cloud. So there's a lot of good activities happens on the uh, on the first initialization phase. And then if we will uh, jump from the theory to a little bit more practical aspects on the uh, real attacks, then there is was a lot of attacks in the wild targeting um, um, uh, boot, boot sequence in order to inject code at different point on the time. Sometimes it could be during the operation system, but in many cases it will go uh, before the operation system in order to disable certain controls in the operation system level, in order to take a more persistency or more stealth functionality or more disruption capabilities like patch and non-patch attacks, which was targeting MBR. So we basically see the, that uh, attackers is not looking only from the uh, poor, um, uh, poor uh, post-infection phases, um, um, uh, post-infection phases when they basically could exfiltrate secrets and things like that, but they're looking also how to stay longer, how to be undetected, how to take full control and make system unbootable. And this is all where the firmware is playing a big role. And in this firmware space, the bootloaders also play a very significant role because they're sitting right before, um, right before the operation system, uh, but uh, after firmware. So it's basically in intermediate between uh, from and uh, the classical operation system software, which was very juicy for the attackers. Um, there's a links uh, to check offline. And then uh, as the response uh, to this previous attack on the bootloaders, uh, the classical MBR VBR type of bootloaders, uh, secure boot technology was invented and was highly pushed. We will talk today uh, really about UFI secure boot there could be a different implementation and there could be different type of rules how to implement secure boot we specifically focus today on the ufi but there's more references could be found on the other implementation as well um so the way uh, how the secure boot works is basically has certain keys and at some point it's not very fine binaries in order to make sure that all of the binaries has the uh, checked by signature. So then uh, we can basically trust this binary and binary wouldn't be running if the if it's not verified. And then uh, um, UFI secure boot create like hierarchical keys uh, or hierarchical kind of um, uh, databases when uh, you can store what kind of binaries is allowed and what kind of binaries is prohibited. And when you have basically a master key which will verify, it's called a platform key, which will verify key exchange key, which will verify DB and DBX databases. Um, in a way, uh, in, in, um, in the UFI secure boot, we have uh, uh, all of these keys stored in the same storage as the system from, it's called SPI storage. So if someone compromised that SPI storage, they can manipulate all of this data. Referring our previous work we've done to show this kind of attacks. Um, so when we, when all of this key working great and uh, firmware has fully, fully configured correctly, no vulnerabilities in any of the implementation pieces uh, uh, on early stage, uh, all of the control move into the bootloaders and bootloaders uh, basically need to enable and Windows and Linux um, boot flow in that case. Uh, there is, uh, in case of Windows, it would be a Microsoft signed bootloaders, which will uh, call then late stage of the Microsoft OS uh, to run late stage boot. And then in case of Linux, then there is something which is called shim, which is basically signed by Microsoft and um, small binary which should transition execution to grab. So it basically all job for shim is basically find the, and verify necessary grab. And um, Shim is signed by Microsoft, but uh, grab could be signed by the Linux distros. So this is how the way Linux enable uh, all of the boot flow on the, uh, on the on the boxes with the Microsoft Secure Boot uh, and UFI Secure Boot practices and how the, they release uh, the signing keys and all of that. Um, so all of this kind of looks good. Uh, and uh, basically what happens is here, and then you will check the signature of the uh, from the DBX uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Microsoft uh, CA um, signed binary 
uh, which would be shim, and then you will move to the grab. The interesting piece here is that when we have a allow database, meaning that all of that binaries from allow database could run in. So if someone replaces one legitimate shim with another legitimate shim, it still will run. If someone replaces one legitimate grab with another legitimate, legitimate grab, it will run. So it doesn't really have a very kind of tie flow that um, that this binary should only be running on this platform with that binary. So it's all exchangeable. And that is also would be a source of the weaknesses as well when we will move uh, in a second on the problems which could be uh, done uh, on this uh, specific um, uh, uh, flow. So then another picture to see how the trust is implemented. So you, you may have hardware to trust here, you may, uh, you may have sign it update here. Uh, you may have, um, uh, full secure boot enable with verification of Dixie components, UFI applications, uh, bootloaders. Bootloaders is just one uh, of the one of the type of the UFI application. And overall, UFI environment is very um, very extensible and very um, complex and juicy for the attacker as well as very good for developers to build um, different use cases. There is like a, a full Wi-Fi stack could be running on a on UFI environment, full Bluetooth stack could be running on UFI environment, TCP IP, IPv6, IPsec, and many other interesting uh, application could be implemented uh, during the early stage on the boot before even operation system run. But coming back to our uh, uh, our scenarios, so um, this scenario is basically if you see a lot of green here, that green meaning that uh, things should be all uh, great together. So if something breaks here, it will break entire uh, trust on the device, and after that, nothing could be trusted. And then at each point on the time, uh, the before break happens, you kind of uh, can trust uh, what happened before, but after it happens, uh, nothing trusted. And that's basically saying that um, it has a single point of failure. So if there would be one weakness is found here, then we have implications for the entire integrity on the box. So the, the rootkits or bootkits could use it uh, to inject itself during the boot, the, the, the boot chain. Um, so uh, just a couple of references on the hardware root of trust. Uh, amazing work done by HP SureStart and Google Titan chip and Apple T2. Interesting that they all have a very specific implementation, very vendor specific implementation, which is very hard to verify and understand how does it work. So you basically need to trust it. So when we're talking about hardware root of trust, maybe Open Titan has much more to understand how does it work. But like if you're talking about Apple T2 and HP Sure Start, and even Intel Bootguard, a lot of uh, assumptions need to be done by trusting certain uh, manufacturer on certain architecture with certain decision they make uh, on the device to have a full um, trust on the device when we're talking about supply chain until the operation phase. So uh, the previous work uh, in this area was very significant and important and demonstrate a lot of uh, weaknesses on, uh, uh, on the boot chain, which would allow attacker to manipulate the, uh, the, the platform and um, inject the components during the uh, early boot phases. Very interesting was research Golden key, Kaspersky boot, uh, Kaspersky bootloader is basically a legitimate bootloader, which is uh, not maintaining signature verification after that. So the attacker could just bring it, uh, launch it, and then run any unsigned code after that. And there was a lot of work related of uh, how can you trust early stages before bootloader, like SPI content, SPI protection, runtime protection of the SMM, uh, different components, different other components protection and how they can be impacted early stage DMA attacks and things like that. Uh, a lot of interesting work was done there. Uh, when we're talking about kind of what kind of risks uh, we possibly can find uh, and exist on this boot chain, um, there could be couple categories. One category could be a misconfiguration, and that's a big one. So someone believed that some, some register should be locked or certain, uh, certain characteristics should be done in one way, but it was not uh, maintained it well until the operation phase, and certain configuration was not setting up, and the attacker could use it to basically disable or inject the code inside the system. 
and it could be implementation issues. So it could be uh, just a buffer flow type of issue. And that's all present in the firmware because most of the firmware wrote in C and they basically are um, acceptable to this type of buffer flow type of vulnerability in almost any phase. And then we see that um, this vulnerability could be inside of bootloaders. And as I mentioned previously, bootloaders is interchangeable. So that uh, gives a lot of flexibility for the attacker. And it could be uh, also, uh, as I mentioned, misconfiguration, but special type of misconfiguration, like unsigned component. So if you really kind of try to build this signature verification process, you must to be worried about every single pointer and every single instruction. If you're running any single instruction or if you're not um, getting integrity of one, any single pointer, then it would allow the attacker to find that and basically manipulate that. There was some vulnerability showing uh, from the bypassing different hardware root of trust, Intel Bootguard bypasses uh, from the different companies, um, different research group, and we demonstrate how to bypass uh, HP Sure Start with the DMA attacks, and there was as a vulnerability shown in a different uh, different area of hardware auto test as well. So demonstrating that in every single step, you may have an issues. And then number of vulnerability going over years uh, is just some statistical representation on the problem. Uh, so when we're talking about like specifically uh, bootloaders, uh, one of them, one of the previous work was done that um, that legacy uh, Ubuntu uh, grab, uh, grab was signed, but didn't check the signature of the later stage, which was also used, uh, could be used by the attacker to um, basically install um, uh, install the, the rootkit. Um, so um, yeah, let me move on. Um, as a type of weaknesses in architecture, uh, which is very related to what I was explaining uh, with uh, interchangeable binaries. So then someone can just bring a vulnerable binary, a vulnerable bootloader to the system in order to replace a legitimate one. And that would be signed and then exploit that vulnerable bootloader in order to um, inject the attacker's code. And the architecture is full, fully flexible for that. So if you're talking about like having a way um, having a way to manipulate this is, would be the you know one of the first thing which would attacker will look, and in many cases, uh, evil made attacks uh, is outside of the scope for many threat models. I didn't talk a lot about threat modeling, but it's another uh, it's another big area on the there basically then OEMs and others um, build a threat model with certain wrong assumptions. But evil made is outside of the scope for many of them, and um, uh, evil made uh, could be uh, easily injecting the code uh, in the Linux boot flow. And uh, overall, uh, UFI partition, which is basically a storage where the UFI bootloader will be stored, is unencrypted. So whoever has physical access to the box can manipulate it. Even if you have full disk encryption, that part will not be there. it will not be encrypted. So now um, that was a very good overview of the different aspects, which is referencing to many different theoretical and practical works. So now it's a little bit about boot hole. And uh, so in uh, in last year, we start looking for the bootloader and look for the what the weaknesses bootloader may have because they are very crucial piece on the boot flow. And we was looking specifically on the grab and how grab is handling the grab config file, which is, um, in in, bas in basic uh, default configuration is not signed and can be manipulated by the attacker. And what we found that uh, that the grub has the vulnerability how they they handle the grub config file and the attacker could use it to inject code to the system. That's exactly where the boot hole was. Um, just a couple details here. It was basically bug between uh, uh, code generated by uh, from Flex and the grab macros definition, how it basically done. When you see uh, this macro here, then you will see that uh, your fatal error is just keep and continue going and doesn't interrupt any processes, which is basically, uh, which is basically um, was not what's, what is expected by the uh, flex generated code. And this basically misunderstanding between different kind of integration blocks 
uh, during the implementation caused this uh, caused this mistake. And it, it takes a years to find this vulnerability because by code audit and no static analysis uh, tools will detect that. Uh, but in another hand, uh, there was not enough significant effort on the dynamic analysis and fuzzing uh, to the grub until we basically arrived to that area. When we chatted with the maintainers on the grub, we found a, a lot of interesting details about priorities and uh, how much security attention was uh, pointing to the grub. And um, yeah, it is a little bit logical bug and staying between components and integration. Maybe you can call it a little bit on supply chain risks, but it still could be found dynamically if there would be enough resources um, um, allocated to the uh, father of grubs. So, and then uh, when you have the overflow, you will control uh, Felix, um, uh, Felix structure, which will basically will go to the uh, strict copy when you will control destination address, which is very classical overflow issue when you can control where you will write and what value you will write, which is basically called write primitive. And in case of the grab, which doesn't have ISLR and DEP in uh, any of the exploit prevention technology, uh, it basically 100% exploitable flow. So you can basically exploit this and inject code uh, in the grub during the boot uh, boot chain by manipulating the config file. Um, moving on, interestingly part that you can say, yeah, but we could monitor a config file. Yes, you can, but you need to do it uh, with the certain assumption because someone can basically uh, hook uh, the way how you would read the file system and will return you the fake uh, config file because grab is running before the operation system. So operation system at that point is not trusted. So from the forensic perspective, you need to do much more work to make sure that you're really reading the file, uh, which is, was not, uh, not hooked and not faked. So when we found this vulnerability uh, in grab, then um, we open up an uh, uh, interesting box of all sorts of vulnerability in Grab because apparently there was not enough attention to the Grab and no one taking care of the Grab uh, overall. So all sorts of different vulnerabilities and even more found after that based on our initial kind of push on that direction and all of these kind of uh, vulnerabilities in different aspects was found. The more resources was allocated by communities. Thanks everyone who was taking care of that. I know that's a lot of work there. Uh, and even more, the NASA was very important aspects there. And I'm almost finishing on the main presentation is uh, architecture. Uh, if you remember that interchangeable piece is very, um, was very flexible, but it has also the downside. So if you're thinking about each grab was vulnerable, then meaning that each shim, uh, which is a trigger grab, uh, also part of the vulnerable chain. So you need to start reworking all of this process. And reworking grab is very complicated because it's thousands of them. So the decision was made that uh, they will be reworked all of the shims, and then they will be basically update all shims in order to uh, in order to basically launch uh, non-vulnerable updated grabs. But even number of shims was very significant. There was about, I think, 200 plus different shims which would need to be revoked. But if you remember when I was mentioned that DB and DBX database stored in SPI storage, SPI storage is very, very limited. It could be 16 megabytes and NVRAM could be one megabyte. And then DBX size could be up to, uh, I, I don't know, maybe 650 entries. So you can only revoke 650 binaries. And if you will, one vulnerability will revoke they will use 200 entries, then basically three of this iteration will fully exhaust all of your storage for the DBX, which would mean in that after that, Secure Boot will start on functional because there will be always binary, which will not be rewalked, which will be vulnerable, could be used by the attacker to, uh, to basically inject code into. So that's why the industry created something which is called SBOT. SBOT is basically slicing on the level when you don't need to rework the entire generation of shim, you basically need to increase the counter. And basically it's sort of a kind of generation slicing when you can basically use less space to revoke all of that generation on shims uh, during the boot sequence. Very, very great solution uh, uh, to balance between the size of the 
NVRAM and DBX and how many revocation needed each time when this type of the vulnerability disc, uh, disclosed. Uh, this, uh, this vulnerability affect all of that uh, boxes which is, uh, have UFI secure boot. It could be uh, normal boxes, it could be network compliances, it could be all sorts of different devices. So when we're talking about mitigation, it should be very precise flow to mitigate it. Because if you will update DBX before you will update bootloader, system will not boot. So you will need to follow very precise mitigation steps when you first update bootloaders, and then you will verify that there's no dual boot or no uh, special configuration there, and then you will update DBX. So mitigation is very specific there. And then uh, it, it can be uh, some of that instability issue if you're talking about deprovisioning machines, so dual boot scenario things like that. Um, and then uh, having this uh, disc um, disaster recovery plan, if this type of situation happens, would be very good practices uh, overall. Um, and uh, even nowadays, we see more revocation happen. So I think about a month ago, there was another DBX update. So following what is inside the DBX update from Microsoft and other kind of sources like UFI forum will give you a good idea of uh, what kind of vulnerabilities was fixed in the bootloaders. Uh, so some of the recommendation uh, to monitor um, the UFI partition and uh, to continuously install the OS updates is like available to check offline. So one of the things we, when we're talking about like boot kits and, and root kits is basically uh, to look on the uh, UFI partition and see what the content there and understand better how the boot flow works and have a more visibility to the boot flow. And even before the operation system, even like in face on the firmware, but in specific when bootloader, and it's not hard, it's just a, a specially mounted UFI partition and the files is there is the normal um, PE files. So you can get the hash, you can check a signature, you can make a database, whitelist, blacklist, you can cross correlate it to the DBX. And there's a couple of nice tools, which is could help you to do that. It's DBX tool, one of that. Uh, tools there. Um, uh, so that just more screenshots and uh, a little bit more disc, uh, explanation on what should be monitored and uh, um, and um, and how. So that's mostly it. I try to make on time. I I think I have maybe one or two extra minutes, but we can use that extra minutes on the more in Q and A session. Thank you very much, Alex, for the great technical presentations.